I guess I, keeping with the uh, title on the, on the schedule, it's a surprise talk. Um, what I really wanted to, uh, sorry, so this is the first talk I've been giving, I'm giving in a pretty long time, in large part because I had a baby, and I realized uh, standing in front of you right now, I should probably have put pictures of my baby in the slides. Did not do that. Great apologies. Um, but uh, so it's, it's my first talk in a while, and that has given me some time to reflect on, on some things. And so the, the talk was called Surprise Talk, and I asked a few times uh, the, the people who run this conference, like, what do you want me to talk about? And they said, like, really, whatever you want to, want to talk about. And of course, that indeed gave me a lot of time to reflect on what I should talk about. Usually, it helps to have some starting point. As DHH says, constraints are liberating. Um, but something happened this week that actually got me thinking. Um, so Tom tweeted uh, that he wrote this post asking Google for better engagement with web frameworks in 2016. And this week, they delivered on my entire wish list. I'm truly over the moon. Um, and Benedict uh, tweeted, for those of you who haven't checked out the Dev Summit keynote by um, Malte and, and Nicole, frameworks are considered first class citizens now, which maybe would be a surprise to everyone in this room who probably uses frameworks. Like, what does it mean that they're not first class citizens? That seems like a surprising piece of news. Um, and there will now be close collaboration between uh, web, web platform and frameworks. How cool is that? And so I realized, th thinking about like, how do you explain what it means that frameworks are now, for the first time, considered first class citizens according to Chrome? What does that mean? Um, it got me thinking about like, what my personal journey was in getting involved in web standards. And I want to start with a disclaimer. There's like a large number of people who were involved in a lot of the story that I'm about to tell you. And I could have spent the entire time um, giving credit and thanking a lot of people um, who were part of all those, um, part of all those moments. Um, unfortunately, I only have 25 minutes. And um, I really know my own, like, how, my own anecdotes better than everyone else's. So I apologize up front for the fact that this is going to end up kind of being myopic from my own perspective, but hopefully my perspective is helpful or useful in some way. Um, so I started um, programming in 2005, which was, I guess, pretty late. Um, and I was, I was just being a, I was an open source person pretty early. and didn't really get involved in any kind of like standards work or any like very serious open source work until like 2008 or 2009 when um, I ended up getting on the Rails core team by building a competitor to Rails, having it be successful, and then us getting together and singing Kumbaya and, and merging the two things together. So I was pretty busy up until that point like trying to figure out how open source worked. And for some reason, like largely because uh, jQuery didn't have good docs, I also ended up being on the jQuery core team around the same time period. So in retrospect, um, that was a pretty early time in my career to be on both of the core teams, but it's just where I was at at the time. And so I was kind of um, pretty aware of how open source worked, how web developers did use things like jQuery and Rails, but pretty unaware of how like, the wider programming ecosystem worked. Um, and I started thinking, because so I, I've been working on jQuery, and I've been working on Rails. And you know, if you're working on jQuery, you like, interact with the DOM a lot. If you're working on Rails, you interact with like, the HTML and the, and the HTTP spec a lot. And occasionally, I would go into a spec to try to figure out like, what is it talking about. And I would, it would be like, really hard to understand what's happening. And so I would ask myself, like, why, why is it so hard? Like, why is it that if I want to understand something, it's really hard to understand? And I started asking around like other people in web standards, like, hey, why, like, what's so hard? And they said, well, why don't, like, we are very enthusiastic to hear your feedback. Why don't you give us some feedback? So I took a look at WebIDL, which if anybody is aware of, probably not the best place to have started. Um, but as I said in my, this is my, really my first standards mailing list post ever. I said, at the urging of some folks, because people claim they really want my feedback, I've poked around and I have some feedback. And Really, my first post ever was like, I'm finding it difficult to understand. Like, I don't understand how to, how to use it. And I think there are other people in the world who are not me who also have that same problem. And the response that I got back in 2009 was, it's a word, I said, don't we agree that it's a worthy goal to actually have a spec that people can understand? 
And the response I got was, it's a worthy goal, but it won't be possible to make it so everyone who finds it, so that everyone finds it easy and quick to understand. The current syntax is not familiar to, only to implementers, but basically anybody who's already doing specs already understands it, so like, sorry, you're out of luck. Um, so sort of what I took away from that conversation in 2009 is like, specs are for implementers, and therefore specs, what they should do is prioritize being understood by people who already understand specs. Unfortunately, this is a bit of a circular problem. It will mean that people can stick around for a long time and they will continue to elevate themselves in the, in the group of people who understand specs, but nobody can get in for the first time unless you're like a, uh, dedicating a lot of time to it because you're an implementer or something. And I realized at the time that there's kind of a structural problem here, which is that when the web creates a new feature, how does it get introduced in 2009? It got introduced as a spec. And they're telling everybody like, hey, you know what would be great? It would be great if everybody, it, all the web developers gave us feedback about these specs. But then they also tell you, oh, but the spec is not for you. You're not supposed to read specs and we're not even really interested in making it easier for you to understand. So basically my, my summary again at the time was basically if spec authors reject the idea of making specs more accessible to web developers and they also require new feedback in terms of specs, then we're just cut out of the process. And Sort of how I felt about that in 2009 was like that, like it's not fair. And then like maybe a little righteously angry, a little like this is really not fair. Um, but I think at the end of the day in 2009, I was like a programmer for four years. So they, I got enthusiastic um, idea in the first place, like you should go in and give us feedback. I gave some feedback. I was basically told this whole process is not really for you. So I kind of just like went away for a bit, and I would say that I was like, oh, well, I, I actually do know how to make Rails and jQuery, so like, I'll just work on that, and I continue to do that for a little while. Um, another thing that sort of happened at the same time that was given, like, a little bit after that, which gave me some perspective, was that John Rezig, who I looked up to and was like, clearly not a new programmer at the time, uh, who created jQuery, was like, oh, it's, you know it would be great? It would really be great if the DOM was as good as jQuery. And there's just no reason why that couldn't be the case. So he wrote a proposal, which was the DOM node list API, that was, uh, if you look at the date on this, it says eight years ago. And many parts of this are still not uh, implemented or even in proposal form. And basically, me watching John not really succeed at getting the Spanish process to take this proposal seriously, which if you look at it, it says you can run the test suite, it has a thousand plus tests, right? So like clearly he had done like really the maximum amount of work that you could possibly imagine to propose and it wasn't really working. So I was like starting to feel like there was, the structural problem might be like pretty serious. Um, not, it's not just me, it's not just I'm a new programmer, but there might be some serious structural issue. And like, I sort of wrapped up working on Rails 3 and like poked my head back up again and like felt like, well, there's still not a ton of people involved in web specs. Like I kind of, like I, my takeaway the first time was it's really unfair, but like maybe I'm just over rotating. Maybe it's like a personal thing. I, maybe I'm making people upset or maybe uh, I'm just too green. I'm too much of a noob. But like I came back and like, oh, it seems like people are claiming that they're very enthusiastic about it. So probably now that people claim they're very enthusiastic, if I wait a little while, people will actually get involved. But what ended up happening was I waited a few years, finished up my other project and noticed that there's still nobody really involved in web specs. And I should say there are, there are a handful of people who are very involved. I think um, Leah Veru is an example of somebody who I look up to a lot and was like involved very early. And these are people who basically put up with an extreme amount of of frustration uh, in order to, to participate. And I'm not meaning to take away from their participation. I ju I'm just meaning to say that there weren't a ton of people involved at the time. Um, so I'm like thinking about this and uh, Chrome actually came out around the same time, right? So before Chrome, there was like Firefox and IE. IE had no standards. Firefox had this like kind of lumbering old standards participation process and like kind of a lumbering old code base. And um, Chrome came out and it like, looked like there was some enthusiasm for maybe doing things differently than the, than the past. Uh, in particular, like Paul Irish, who was kind of like an a enthusiastic uh, developer evangelist before he joined Google, joined Google and became an enthusiastic developer evangelist at Google. And like, 
Paul and I were both on the jQuery team and we talked a lot about like, what can we do about this? Like this problem seems bad. It seems like something we should do about it. Like what can we do about it? And the first thing we said is like, well, maybe if we like DDoS the standards process with a lot of feedback, maybe they will notice that there's more feedback than they thought. Because one of the things that people said at the time was, there just aren't that many people who are like really capable of understanding enough to give good feedback. They would say like, oh, you guys are just not really capable of this. So we said, well, maybe we could just like show empirically that that's not true. So I tweeted this thing that said like, what is the one browser bug you could fix? Uh, hold on, I have, no. Ah. Uh, what is the one browser bug you could fix or feature you could add significantly to improve what you could build on the web? And basically the idea was, they, like the browser vendors and the spec authors, their perspective at the time was like, you need to understand very, very elaborate things in order to give feedback, but actually this question is probably the right question to ask if you wanna figure out what to do. So let me ask that question. And um, Paul wrote a blog post right afterwards about the feedback and you can see it said, we got a great response, 230 plus responses. And I was pretty shocked actually at the time. This was like 2009, I don't even know how many people were on Twitter at the time, or 2011. But that was like a lot of responses to get. And I embedded an iframe here because I couldn't think of a better way of giving a sense of the amount of responses that we got. But there were a lot of responses that were actually pretty good. Um, it's actually a good list to go back to now because a surprising amount of this is not done. I'm still scrolling. Um, so anyway, we, I like, I like this one. Is this a trick? Uh, so we were basically like, maybe we can like illustrate directly that there is a huge amount of enthusiasm for things that are just being ignored. Because basically the idea that people can't give feedback was resulting in a lack of representation from, of web developers, which was resulting in uh, web developer interest just not being that um, considered. So I, I, we did that and it, like people noticed. Um, and I, we, me and Paul were like, well, we just, we really need to show up and actually start like banging the gong. Um, but we had this problem, the problem that I said before, which is that if fundamentally, if spec authors are like, you are, we're not willing to make specs more accessible to web developers, and we think that's actually a, a bug, it's like a non-goal. Non On the other hand, all, this, all the specs are coming out as specs, all the proposals are coming out of specs, were cut out, it actually seems like structurally there's a problem. So the good news about this is that um, thinking back on this, like in 2011, I realized that Chrome really changed things. Um, among other things, like standards bodies, even though they hadn't really grappled with the consequences of, of the problem, were like very convinced that they wanted more developer involvement. And they were still repeating like developers aren't, don't have time for this kind of grunt work or like people aren't capable or whatever. But ultimately if you ask them, people were like very enthusiastic about the idea of getting more help. And also another subtle thing that happened was that the Chrome team brought in a lot of ex web developers. So people like, um, like Alex Russell, who worked on Dojo, was now like a person working on the C++ part of Chrome. So, and that, there were a bunch of people doing that. So there was definitely a sense in which a, there was a little bit of representation on the Chrome team, mostly of people who used to be web developers, but there was, you still like remember something about it, and there was more motivation to do something. Um, so kind of looked at it and I was like, well, I guess that it's time to crash the gates, basically. We were probably a little over-enthusiastic about what we could do, but I think we, we felt like basically the time is now. Like we did this huge survey. There's like a, a surprising amount of things that people want done that aren't getting done. Like we should try to do something about it. And the first thing that we did was we joined TC39. So at the time, there were zero people on TC39 who worked on, who wrote JavaScript or web software for a living. It was either like I would say academics or theoreticians or implementers of web browsers, but zero web developers on TC39 at all. And today that's not true and I'll talk about that um, as I go on. But at the time, like one of the reasons that nobody was joining was that there was a sense like, oh, you have to pay to join TC39, so like how can you join? Obviously I don't have the money to join a pay for play organization. And turns out that if you look at the rules of TC39, 
not-for-profit organizations are allowed to join for no fee. And the jQuery Foundation, which was the group that Paul and I were involved in at the time trying to do something about this, was a registered nonprofit. So we were able to join, and um, we were able to become members. Now, I think uh, ECMA immediately was like, oh, shit, that seems like a very big loophole. But I think ultimately nobody wanted to say, like, jQuery is not allowed to be on TC39. Like, we followed the rules, and I think that was... Uh, more or less good enough for, for them. And I think that basically one of the takeaways I had was like really pay attention to when people say you can't do that because X, Y, Z, you can't join TC39 because it will be too expensive. Like, like really investigate whether that's true. And after joining TC39 and becoming, uh, I joined with Rick Waldron. We became the first two people who were web developers on TC39. Um, I ran with a few people to reform the W3C tag, which is like the, the, the steering committee, I guess, of, of W3C. And like I said, a bunch of stuff. It's like probably cool blog post to still read at some point. I made jokes about uh, RFCs. Um, but, and, and after running, we won. Um, so four, four people uh, ran on the idea of actually getting more involvement about the regular day-to-day. -day. So TC39 had problems, but the W3C at the time was full of people who thought that the web, the job of a web standards body was the semantic web, which has nothing to do with the web as we in this room understand it. So there was a big project there of like resuscitating the W3C's core architectural ideas around web architecture and not around semantic web architecture, which only is the same thing only in name only. And like one of the things I noticed when we joined was like the tag still was using CVS at the time, not, not SVN. Like some of us might remember SVN. They were literally using CVS, so I had to get like a CVS account and whatever. And one of the first things that we did was like just put the tag on GitHub. And like you'd be surprised at how controversial that was, but it was actually a big deal because it, made, it meant that there was a way that people understood how to participate in the process. Like, GitHub issues and pull requests that people found familiar that was now how you also interacted with what was, frankly, a pretty stodgy organization that had nothing to do with your needs, right? But if the only way to participate before was like mailing lists and CVS, like, good luck. But if you can file issues, that helps. Um, but there was still this problem. Um, so sort of the idea was like, we need to, we need, first we need to have representation so like we can if we want to reform any of the structural problems, we actually need to be there and like in the place where you're supposed to be to technically make the proposals. But there was still this issue of like, functionally, this was not a rule anywhere, but functionally, the way the web standards feedback loop worked functionally cut out web developers. And I realized that because of the, the moment that, we, that that was in, we were able to, um, we were able to really change how we thought about it. And I think if you think about it today, that problem doesn't exist anymore. And one of the big watershed moments was um, I decided to reach out to all the people involved in web standards who shared basically a view of this problem. And um, I wrote this extensive web manifesto, which was then signed by a lot of people, which I'll show in a second. But the key thing that the extensive web manifesto said was, it's actually pretty bold. It says, we want to change how web standards committees create and prioritize new features. And importantly, we want to tighten the feedback loop between editors of web standards and web developers. So that, if you, if you ever heard of this, like, it's probably worth going back and reading. But the key thing was we said we have a manifesto that says that we need to fix the structural problem. And like, a cool thing about it was a lot of people signed it. Um, so again, because the moment was ripe for getting agreement on something, a lot of people signed something that fundamentally said that the old structural problem was not OK anymore. So that, that happened in like 2013. And I could spend like another hours talking about all the things that happened in between. Because frankly, once we got to a point where there was a more appropriate feedback loop, I wouldn't say it was perfect by any means. But there was like web developers are structurally allowed to be in the conversation. Um, a lot of the next, like the story of the next five years is like doing work like actually doing work. And I think things like Service Worker actually landed, and that, um, like, the Chrome team gets a lot of credit for that, but so do all the web developers who um, push back against app cache not working so, so well and really pushing hard on, on a new f feature and, like, helping people who are motivated to do it uh, convince their colleagues, right? So 
a lot of the work of the next few years is really just like doing work. Um, but I want to, so I, I'm going to sort of skip ahead like the boring doing work part and just talk about like by the, by the, by the numbers basically. So first of all, I want to say we still have a lot of work to do. Like, um, sorry, in part, in part because just like there's a lot, always a lot more to do, but in, also in part because the problem of underrepresentation in tech is not limited to web developers. There's a lot of groups that are underrepresented, and the benefits that we got from in, include, increasing the number of web developers in standards bodies is, are also the same as the benefits that you get from increasing participation of any underrepresented group for all the reasons that the previous talk was talking about. So there's still a lot of work to just actually continue to increase representation in standards, and, it, and I don't want to sugarcoat where we're at, so I want to say that. But overall, the sentiment that we have right now is much healthier. And part of what that means is that we now try very hard, at least in TC39, to co-locate our meetings with community events like JSConf EU so that we can um, hold things like this, this um, what was this thing called? It was called a panel. Um, so we can hold panels, and like basically everyone at JSConf EU got to ask um, uh, committee members what they thought about various in-flight features and like the general process. And the group of people on the stage here are actually pretty representative of TC39, and um, largely are people doing day-to-day -day JavaScript work. And I think that's pretty great. Um, that I also uh, just need to call out. If I'm going to call out anybody here. Computer, computer, OK. Uh, Dan has been doing a huge amount of work to try to just increase the amount of feedback that TC39 gets. So this is like him giving a talk on, like, we want your help to make the next JS. Um, but really what this what has been about is Dan has, been, has poured a ton of time into creating uh, community groups. So there's an educator group, a, a framework group, a transpiler group that is basically just getting feedback from groups of people that maybe don't have time or money to join TC39 or to travel, but who have very useful feedback and having regular meetings where those groups of people can give their feedback about proposals and actually bring that feedback back to TC39. Um, doing more of that has been valuable, and I think that's kind of the next frontier, at least for TC39, is like just making more of these not in the committee groups of people just to get feedback funnels working. Um, and remember, when I joined TC39 in the first place, there were no web developers working on TC39, there was the best we had was people who used to be web developers who were on TC39. Um, but now, today, there are J JavaScript developers who work day to day on JavaScript from big companies like Google and Facebook, for small companies like the one I work at, Galio and Boku. There's people who represent frameworks, there's people who represent libraries, there's people who represent compiled to JavaScript languages, there's people who represent transpilers like Babel, there's uh, now Node joined, NPM joined, right? So now we have, like, it used to be zero in 2011, and now in, 20, in 2018, it's really a very, very robust group of people representing a whole bunch of different um, parts of the ecosystem. And it just goes without saying that when you have this many um, groups of people involved, the kinds of objections that people have when they just don't have JavaScript developers in the room just don't go very far. Right? So you could say, you used to be able to say, like, oh, I don't know if anybody uses function declarations or whatever. And now if you say, like, people, like, there actually was an argument that, like, oh, we should just switch to, like, some other thing because no one uses that feature. Or, like, AMD is good enough. Nobody, we don't need standard modules or whatever. And, like, these days, there's enough JavaScript developers. Like, frankly, we, we argue amongst each other. Like, we have so many people that now, like, our, now the, the group of, of JavaScript practitioners is... We're, we're actually able to have debates amongst ourselves without feeling like, like we're too small, right? So now there's just a huge amount of JavaScript developers representing a huge amount of different interests on the committee. And I th this has been like really the, I'm very proud of, of this result. Um, going back to the beginning of the story here, um, at the beginning of this talk, so one thing that was kind of sad that I skipped over in between 2013 and 2018 is that Browser developers didn't always see web developers as allies. And part of the reason for that is that as mobile took off um, and browser vendors got squeezed for performance, browser vendors would go look at, like, why is the verge.com very slow? And they would say, oh, your JavaScript is terrible, and you're using this like, terrible framework with these terrible tools. And like, if only everybody just hand wrote everything by hand, everything would be better. And 
like that is a thing that people uh, that is a thing that people would say. So Alex in 2016, who co-signed the Extensible Web Manifesto and like points this out in this thread, basically says like, seriously, folks, it's time to throw out your frameworks and see how fast the browser can be, right? And, and basically, um, not to not to uh, say anything about Alex, but there was definitely, even though we like got a, a agreement um, across a lot of people about the Extensible Web Manifesto. Um, what started, like, there was a period of time where there was just not a very strong alliance between browser vendors and web developers, especially framework developers. I, again, I think a big part of that had to do with mobile squeezing browser vendors for performance. They're hearing about it from people who say, why is your browser so slow? And they're trying to figure out how to explain it. Um, and so that's why this thing that happened this week was so important. So Nicole got up on stage and said, uh, it's not that you should throw out your framework. Um, frameworks sometimes make apps slower, but they're also our best hope to make them faster. And Malte Ubel, who, who uh, made AMP, said, that's a bold statement. And she said, yes, that is a bold statement. Um, but the, I think the point is we're finally coming to the end of the story here, where um, we're finally coming back to us actually all being in it together, which I think was, we had it for a moment in 2013, and I think we've kind of gone around the block a little. Um, so another thing, just to, just to give them credit, is um, they're now including frameworks, like the popular frameworks, in the intent to implement process. So the intent to implement process is like how Chrome announces, like, we're going to implement this feature that is a standard. And like, people can come in and be like, oh, that would be really hard to implement, or like, that would require a re-architecture of the entire blah, blah, blah system, so sorry. Um, they're basically now involving framework authors like myself in the process of like, deciding what to do. And I should be clear, like, Chrome is not the web. And there already is a standards process that web developers are already involved in, like because of all the work that people have done. So this is not like Chrome doesn't get to involve web developers, but there was a problem, which is that at the end of the day, browser vendors have a lot of control over what, goes, what happens in the process because they're the ones who get to ship. So a big browser saying, like, we're involving regular web developers in the decisions about shipping things um, really makes a big difference in terms of like, where the leverage comes from in the, in the standards process. So that's really exciting. Um, and in general, like that point, the bullet point three is like a very vague thring, thing, but in general, Chrome has spent a lot of effort in the past year, more or less, of really involving web developers more in their own process. So like I said, I could, I could give a whole talk on like how to get involved, but I'll give you like my quick hits here. So first of all, like if you're interested in doing technical work and you want to do something with standards, like Go ask your favorite framework author, like, hey, you, you probably have standards goals. Like, what could I help with? And there's actually a lot of stuff. Like, um, as much as I made fun of the testing thing before, um, you could write tests. You can do a whole bunch of stuff. Um, so I'm just delegating to your, yes, I see. I'm almost out of time. I have like three slides left. Uh, this thing is a thing a lot of people don't know about. Um, so this is like a really well-organized dashboard that tells you like where every single TC39 proposal is by stage. Um, each one of them links to a TC39, uh, links to a repository which has regular issues and regular pull requests and um, does things the usual GitHub way. And it tells you like what the progress is. So um, definitely check this out if you're like, I wonder what the status of that feature is or how can I help move this feature over the finish line? Um, maybe you can write that. Um, you can also try features out with Babel. I put a star there because there are some like ornery TC39 members who get angry when you say like, oh, people tried it out with Babel and now we shouldn't do something different because people liked it. Uh, I think increasingly those people are not winning, but there is definitely a sense that like we shouldn't feel beholden to whatever happened to ship in Babel. And I think like as a user trying to things out in Babel, you should realize that. Um, like I said, it's a big deal that things are on GitHub. Like, just go to, like, if you're wanting to talk about decorators or optional chaining or pipeline or whatever, just go to the, go to the repo, look for an issue that you're interested in, open an issue, um, help write explainers, facts, whatever. People really love the help. And I just want to close by, um, with the uh, part of the Extensible Web Manifesto. This is what the Extensible Web Manifesto closed with. And what I basically said was, you know, the open web is seen as always being behind the walled garden competitors. Like, open web is seen as being worse than iOS or worse than Android. And there's a real, a good reason why that's not true, which is that Android and iOS comes down from a mountain every year, and they hand you the things that their developers came up with. And so the feedback loop is really slow. 
And when things are working well on the web, um, we have a path for good ideas from web developers to become a part of the infrastructure of the web. And what I said in the Extensible Web Manifesto that got so many, so many signatures is uh, we have to enable web developers to build the future of the web. And I think more than ever now, that's possible. And I, so I would encourage everyone here to help build the future of the web. Thank you very much.